Uh, please welcome uh, Brian Feit and Gabe Weaver, um, who will be talking about subs, ships, um, and satellites. And now the stage is yours. And the subtitle is The Internet of Invisible Things. <coughs> so with that, I guess uh, we could do quick introductions. Gabe? Yeah, sure. My name is Gabe Weaver. I'm a researcher from the University of Illinois. Um, I'm really into interdisciplinary research, and I'm, I'm longing for it. So if you have any kind of interesting kind of perspectives, I'm, I'm all ears. And my name's Brian Fight. I'm the guy that used to say no, and now I have to facilitate yes. And what I mean by that is, um, I think, germane to today's uh, keynote. I've been one of those pundits out there breaking stuff and talking about how stupid people are because they can't fix it. And now I have the responsibility for fixing it on a limited budget or advising people to that end. So, you know, karma. <laughs> ah, so, um, last couple years we've been talking about when worlds collide, and what do I mean by that? It's not just this, uh, you know, awesome reference in Seinfeld, I don't know if you're f familiar with it, but it's when the, the uh, friends and the, uh, the girlfriend's worlds come together, that's a bad thing. And in these two worlds that I'm talking about are what we might call the IT and the OT world, or the cyber and the physical. And when we talk about these two disciplines or domains, which we refer, I heard in the previous um, uh, morning sessions, talking about those different domains, um, cyber or information security is a rather young science, air quotes, uh, in that we don't really necessarily uh, uh, approach it uh, as a science or discipline. And 30, 40 years maybe, you can even go back farther when it was theoretical, versus hardcore en engineering which has been around for, for thousands of years, um, is, a, is a discipline that's, that's treated uh, as a science. And those two uh, domains were, were separate for a long time. What I call the ITOT borderlands, or the firewall demark between your plants, manufacturing plants, or your critical infrastructure, and your um, enterprise. And th th those two worlds, uh, they don't really get along. Uh, they don't talk the same language when we talk about um, uh, the, uh, the discipline there. We'll, we'll go into detail of why those worlds uh, don't get along very well and why, if we're going to have a, a safe future, they have to come together. So, now we think about all these great things, humans' achievements, what we're doing. The idea is that there's a human beneficiary. We are pr presumably building these systems uh, to uh, benefit humans. So human beneficiaries, and what do I mean by that? Well, to make them healthier, wealthier or just a sense of well-being. So when we, we start to look at these systems, and these humans, uh, I don't think at least from our cyber discipline, we, we leave that out of the equation a bit. So I want to kind of bring that in because humans do matter. And uh, when I talked about uh, the two different domains, when we look at those things, uh, we talk about cyber security. And when you talk about engineering sciences, it's more around safety and quality. So when these two domains come together, we might need uh, a way to talk about these things uh, intelligently and to each other. Uh, exposure index. So exposure index is basically, it's hard to see up here, but this idea that if you have a motivated adversary, they will develop a capability to, um, to take advantage of some vulnerability. If you can reduce any of those to zero, then you might have a good metric uh, to, to, to manage your program. Uh, and a lot of times, people don't believe they have a, a motivated adversary. So hopefully, we can dispel some of that. And, and um, as far as those two different domains, I'll tell you conversations I'm having with OT or plant ICS security people today. And it sounds very similar to uh, discussions we were having with cyber folks uh, 30 years ago. So you go and say, well, maybe, what do you do to protect your plants from some type of injection attack? And they go, well, why would anybody do that? So those systems were always meant to be air gap. You never had uh, anything connecting. Uh, and that air gap is gone today. So the world has changed because executives want their dashboards. And you get, in my mind, I could see you know, somebody playing a round of golf, looking at their smartwatch, and say, oh, yes, I just made another X amount of uh, uh, profit. So. We'll come back and talk about this, um, why this is important. And so when we, we want to think about these two worlds colliding or coming together, there, there's danger. 
And when I first started this research, it was, it was hey, the cyber uh, domain, the physical engineering domain coming together, humans are going to get hurt. And I was at lunch with Vit and Surf, and he goes, ah, grasshopper, you forgot about the other thing that hurts humans, and that's privacy. So the idea that we have to um, not only worry about security, uh, engineering, and safety, but that also humans could be hurt if there's a lack of privacy. And a lot of these systems, you know, that's somebody else's problem, which we'll talk about. Uh, and this is not a tomorrow problem, it's a today problem. There's about, last check, seven, over 7.6 million humans on the planet. Uh, by this estimation, and I, these numbers here don't really bother me, it's this 25 billion embedded intelligent systems, whatever an intelligent system in, is. That's typically something that has a shelf life of 10, 20 years. It's not really designed to be secure because it d can't afford that in processor. Uh, or energy, but there's a lot of them. So we're already outgunned or outmanned if you're just doing sheer numbers of them and us. And yes, I'm a xenophobe, um, you know, learning to hide from robots. Uh, here's a classic uh, trolley car scenario, and this is the idea that we are creating killer robots without even trying. Uh, are you guys familiar with the trolley uh, experiment? Essentially, you have a runaway, let's call this a smart car, that's careening down the road. Um, the autonomous systems, uh, are, it's an autonomous vehicle, and uh, there's three choices it can make. It can continue go moving straight, and it will kill the little child and the caretaker, the child in the pram, or does it make the decision to turn left and run over the little old lady, or does it turn right, uh, going off a cliff, killing the, um, the driver or the owner of the vehicle, uh, and destroying itself? Is there a right or wrong answer to this question? Why can't it just stop? It, it's malfunctioned. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and, and, and that would be the, the logical way to program such a vehicle. But if it doesn't work, then it has to go to its secretary. And the, the, if it stops, there's 100 people uh, piling off behind it. Yes, you just now created the biggest traffic jam uh, and loss of life doing that. So it's, it's those types of scenarios, and the, really, the exercise here is to talk about it. MIT has, a, and I can share this link later, they actually have a website where they've collected everybody's decisions at, uh, around this or their opinions around it. And um, you know, a lot of people says, well, the old ladies had a great life. So, and this is like, well, there's, there's two people here, um, and then there's actually, you know, hey, I'm not going to destroy myself as an autonomous vehicle. Maybe I don't have consciousness yet, but as a vendor of those autonomous vehicles, and there is one vendor who has come out, and I won't mention their name, but has basically said, we will not kill our drivers. So if you see one of those autonomous vehicles, you know, get out of their way because it's possible <laughs> that you're uh, the threat center. The point here is, if we don't model these and come up with you know, all the different permutations, this system will make a decision and it will be made the way it's programmed and it will be made based on the best information it has. So maybe we should model it and not let the machines decide. Um, also this morning we talked a little bit about what I call point of origin hacking. At some point, somewhere in history, somebody said, oh, I could hack that web page if I did this. And maybe they didn't do anything about it. Uh, or maybe they decided to go and create a capability. And that point, when it's theoretical to where they have a private capability, what we might call a zero day, uh, and the point that they publish or everybody realizes what's going on, that might be the gap to, con to consider uh, for your risk uh, assessments. But in reality, it's much better if you could take these theoretical vulnerabilities and put them into your threat catalog. The reason we don't do this today is because all the practical people have told us you can't protect against those. You, you really can't do threat modeling very well today, so why would you consider theoretical vulnerabilities that are 20, 30 years out? Well, we just discussed today, these assets that we're building today, you know, these assets of today are the future um, legacy systems of tomorrow, so maybe we should give some thought to it. But wait, there's more. So this is the old stuff, the cyber physical. We've been talking about this for a while. Um, we want to introduce something else. I'm going to paraphrase Douglas Adams. It says, the secret to being invisible is to be somebody else's problem. Right? So we probably see things all the time that we could address. Not my problem, not my job. What's the new one? Not my monkeys, not my circus. Mm -hmm. That might be the, the issue here. So um, if we had a someone else's problem uh, generator, we could actually be, have invisibility. But 
This is why we, we call this the internet and visible things. We want to talk about those things that are somebody else's problem, but they don't have a caretaker. So in reality, they're everybody's problem. So what are the wicked problems on our horizon that we want to try to solve? We basically got a whole bunch of different systems um, that are interconnected that we may or may not understand how those systems connect. And we could just say that's the internet, right? That's the internet in the internet of weird, deadly, dangerous, invisible things. But it's actually their interconnectedness, their dependencies on each other, the processes uh, that create those um, uh, vulnerabilities, uh, the potential uh, for bad things. And it's also stakeholders. There's a lot, these might be the people who care. And these stakeholder communities uh, may or may not know about each other. Uh, and they, you know, when we really think about stakeholders, that's not only uh, the defenders or the asset owners or asset, asset uh, custodians, but it's also the adversaries. So they have stakeholder communities also, and that's important. And now what we're really trying to find out uh, using these abstracts is can we model it? Can we take a very specific stakeholder view so that you at least know what your problems are and then understand the dependencies that you have on the other system elements and then understand how these disruptions cascade through that system? So we've all heard the butterfly flapping its wings in one part of the world can impact something else. Uh, Mariah Botnets today, one of the things that we didn't talk about was the unintended consequences. A lot of people lost Netflix. Twitter was down when that was going on. Now you could argue that's a first world problem, uh, not having Netflix available, but did we really know that Netflix was using the same DNS provider? I had no idea Dyn DNS had anything you know, like that. So I learned something from that through that impact. And so those hidden dependencies, the way these cascade, or the way systems are intended to fail and how they really will fail, we need a way to model that. And that's kind of what brings us here today to talk about the things that we've, you know, we're concerned with and we're trying to do. So we published a white paper called The Internet of Invisible Things and it brought together the hiding from robots themes and the cyber physical modeling stuff that we've been doing. And it's really to you know, focus on you know, this maritime ecosystem. So the, the title subs means, well, there's a whole 70% of, of the Earth's surface is covered in water. So unless we have a lot of divers in the room or people who are spending time in subs, we don't see that. It's just naturally invisible because of its nature. Um, subs are very interesting, though, because uh, his, you know, the first time that a submarine was actually used in warfare was during the, uh, um, the uh, America's Revolutionary War, and that's really what progressed it. So signal ops and all the technology that was developed for these systems, uh, you know, we're really good when we're trying to, to hurt each other for some reason. Uh, ships, so that's below the water. On the surface of the water, ships. 90% um, of everything in the West that's consumed at some point in its ecosystem was on a ship, whether that's the raw materials or the finished goods. Uh, there's also kind of a weird thing. In America, you can um, have a processed chicken marked as made in America, but in reality, what they do is they grow the chickens in America, they put them on freezer ships, they send them over to another country to be processed, then they refreeze them and send them back. Um, so they, they were grown, processed somewhere else, sold in America, and somehow that's economically viable that just boggles my mind. So a lot of stuff going on with ships. And then satellites, because we love threes, but this is above. And this is another place that we have a lot of dependencies, uh, communication systems, things that we think about that re rely on uh, satellites. And they are visible. I mean, you can track them. You can look at the sky. Sometimes you can't see them because they're not there. Uh, but in reality, very few people are looking to the stars and trying to understand the dependencies they have on satellites until you're dish goes out or your favorite football game, you can't see it. So I, I encourage you to um, download the white paper and get all the gory details behind our research. And just to show you one specific system, ecosystem that uses all three of those elements, anybody familiar with the tsunami warning system? Okay, so it's pr fairly basic uh, under, the, under the ocean at, at various uh, strategic places probably uh, serviced vis-a-vis -vis subs or scuba peoples, uh, there are uh, sensors that are put on the bottom of the seabed. And those essentially look for seismic activity. And they're pushes in far enough uh, or in between land masses, so they're going to pick those up. They then use an acoustic communication system 
to a, a buoy that's anchored to the floor, uh, ocean floor, and that in turn detect, gets the sensor readings and then sends that up to a satellite, which then sends the um, communication, the warning back to the base stations, and then it's disseminated. This ecosystem is fascinating. This is gonna be the next level uh, of my research on this stuff, and I'll probably be in the break it side next time. But um, anybody who's interested in talking about this afterwards, I'd like to you know, deep dive on it, pardon the pun. And there you go. So you have all three of those in one uh, ecosystem. So deep dive, Q, Gabe. Deep dive. That was a uh, so the deep dive pun is, is pretty fun to be able to say. But anyway, so what uh, we've been looking at at the, the university is shipping ports, actually. So I'm going to walk you through some dependencies on shipping ports in particular. Uh, the work's been done with the University of Illinois, and we're looking at assessment and measurement of port disruptions. So you need to understand the transportation system, but also where there's the, the computer network, where the communications network hook into that, and maybe also some electrical power systems if we get more funding, but that's the, that's the plight of the academic life, right? So, and also we have some cool visualizations being done by RS21 and some coding done by Heartland. So anyway, this is for a, an engineering open house, so I have the start button here on my slides, which makes it kind of fun. Uh, so we've selected a shipping port, and currently have two shipping ports we're looking at. We've focused mostly on the ports, uh, not the ports of Auckland, but on Port Everglades, Florida. Uh, port Everglades, Florida is a pretty interesting port, and I'll tell you more about why in a second. But Ports of Auckland is interesting as well because there's a lot of automation. And the reason it has automation going in is because there's just no way they can move an entire location of a port. There's not enough money. But ships are getting bigger and bigger. So what are you going to do? You need a way to efficiently move more and more containers. And so as a human, you're like, up. Oh, kind of have to, in order to compete in this world, you have to be able to be, become more and more efficient and faster. And so you become more and more dependent on these machines, right? That kind of puts us in a rough position, though. Um, because now we, we're creating an environment where you don't even understand all the interdependencies that exist. There's invisible things. How do you like validate or verify that as a human? It's a pretty rough thing. It's a good business model, but it's a pretty rough thing if you think of like a human needing to survive. And is the solution the problem to throw more tech? I don't know. I'm rambling now, but um, that's the thing. So here's a video of Port Everglades. It moves pretty quickly. We have a container ship coming in. They don't actually go that fast. <laughs> <laughs> they, I can't, they should, it's cool. And Graham, maybe that's your future research. You got a crane loading up some trucks. It goes into a container yard. Some of these are perishable, like Chiquita used to be here um, in Port Everglades. So that's an important thing to be able to get. You want to make sure you have fresh fruit and produce. They're scanned on their way out for radiation. But again, so many containers move through. Whatever are we going to do? And they go out by road or plane or train, and that's the end of the video. So there's a lot of intermodal interconnectivity there as well. And that's interesting because there's different costs associated with how you move things, whether you're going by road or rail or air or barge. Barge, barge is like, well, I think one barge, I believe, hand wavy, but it's about seven trains. Um, so you can imagine the importance of that barge system be able to work. Uh, so shipping ports are critical to modern commerce. Yes, indeed. There's about 367. Some of the folks at the US Coast Guard said not 360, 367. I'm like, OK, give me a break. Um, <laughs> sea and river ports in the United States. So it's not just the ocean. Everybody likes to be able to do research trips to the ocean. But you know, the, the intermodal, the, uh, the inland waterways are really important as well. 95% uh, of US goods go through these ports. And so that's very important. If you pardon that painful pun. And they're a nexus of critical infrastructure systems. And this is why um, they're interesting from a research perspective. Because you can go to one spot and you can see, OK, the transportation system. I can see the power system. I can see the communications network. And so that's what we're going to see. So in communications and IT, you need navigation. You have an automatic identification system that tells you where the ships are, where they've been, where they're going. Uh, you have GPS, which they definitely rely on for navigation. Uh, there used to be other systems, but now it's primarily GPS, so that's of a lot of concern. Uh, automation and logistics, you have this terminal operating system, which is kind of your, your, your brains of the, the project, right? Just how we have files in our, in our computer systems. Uh, so do we have entries as to where containers are and where they need to go over time in these terminal operating systems. And physical access control, 
you have the identification card so you can get through the gates and get to where you need to go. How do you know you are who you say you are? Well, there's different credentialing systems. Monitoring, so this is an example where we're trying to address problems with our, our limitations as humans by throwing more technology at it. And that will get us so far, I think, but personally, I don't think that's going to last for too long. Um, like if you're talking about if, if I have grandkids or something, for example, I don't know if they'll be too happy like, with this strategy. Um, I think eventually because you're going to need to have people back in the equation. You can't just get rid of people more and more. Because if something bad happens with the cameras, you need to deploy people to watch the fences. See, at some point, you can't keep cutting. Um, but that's just a belief. Transportation sector, you have intermodal road, rail, and air, and ship, and airship as well in the slides, but airships are not used here. And then the just-in-time supply chain. So the thing is, uh, we like to run things so that everything happens just in time. You don't have to hold lots of inventory at all. And that is great from a business standpoint. In, in manufacturing, that's, that's, if you hear digital disrupting, you said industry 4.0. It's all about um, no downtime for scheduled maintenance, uh, just-in-time supplies so that you're not keeping inventory. And any disruption in the force or that supply chain can have, you know, serious impact. So, I mean, there, there you go, right? Like, so it's not the most resilient system, but it's economically rewarded. But is that really how we want to be playing that, that game? And then the energy sector as well, you have petroleum, oil, natural gas going through. Um, and that's important because in the case of places like Port Everglades, Florida, you're talking about supplying Southern Florida, which has a lot of population. So there, there's really important things there. Electrical power as well. So this is uh, port operations. The first thing of the research, we're, we've only done this research maybe about 11 months at this point. So first we need to get out into the field, understand how shipping ports actually work. And so breaking outside the ivory tower. Um, so here's a picture of Port Everglades. They talk about in terms of uh, different sections. So North Port, you have your petroleum operations. South Port, you have your container operations. They're bound together by road systems. There's only like one or two roads that connect the two. You have this channel right here where vessels will come in and out of. One way in, one way out. One way in, one way out. Um, and you have this channel here where vessels will be cruising our Coast Guards right here. We also have things like, um, I think it's the Harmony, uh, cruise ships. So that means, what's interesting about Port Everglades is they actually beat the world record for most number of people in a day, twice, for cruise. So that means you're expecting to have a lot of people that you don't really know moving in and out of those facilities. And so there's some interesting physical um, security problems potentially with that. Uh, so let's move and take a look at petroleum operations, just kind of the workflow, get a feel for, for the workflow. So a petroleum pier, um, you know, tankers are gonna come in, and they, you know, you have like a gallon of milk. Let's say you have a gallon of milk. Um, Liters. I, I can't do it, I, I only know- It's it. not as heavy. <laughs> so, so I'm broken, right? Because I, I don't do the metrics, but uh, the, the, yeah, anyway. <laughs> gallon, Sorry. Yeah, this thing, it's like about this big, right? It's a gallon of milk, and you imagine now 300,000 of those coming in, and that's about the size and number of uh, things of gasoline you have per tank or per day coming in and out. Every one and a half days, you get 300,000 gallons of this stuff coming in. And you need to move it through in an efficient manner, and then you store it in a tank. And so they're pumped underground. I'll show you a picture of that cartoon example of that. And they're stored in these tanks. And you know how much or how little is stored in there it depends on the, the competitor. And that's kind of guarded. Trucks have to come in and out of this place. And so there's access controls. Um, that's the primary way that this stuff gets out, in addition uh, for gasoline, at least. And at the load rack, well, the stuff coming in comes in at 85 octane. Uh, to be sold in the U.S. needs to be 87 or higher. And so how does that actually happen? Well, you have to blend it, and you blend it with ethanol. Ethanol can come in by barge, it can come in by truck, but it's cheapest if it comes in by train. So what's interesting here is you have this interdependency then on the railway system to be working correctly. Now, railroads go over roads. So if you have congestion on your roadway, that can impair your ability to get the ethanol in and out. And you got to think about the timing of things as well, the, the time of the year. But being aware of those kinds of interdependencies is really important if you're going to conduct what-if scenarios, which is the point of the research. It's to be able to go out multiple hops. We maybe we think in chess maybe two or three moves, but with the algorithms, you can think out n moves and start rewinding and replaying things. As access roads important. 
trucks move in and out of the port via access roads such as that one, but the crews does too, and there's shared resources there. And the pipeline's really important because it transports jet fuel to surrounding airports. So then there's another interdependency you have, right? And these pipelines you can't monitor uh, using anything but, I mean, you could, but you'd ha you have to walk the line, but it would take forever. You really need to be able to have distributed sensors that you can trust. Sensors. And sometimes robots will go through. They'll put robots through the pipeline. So it's all. Mm, Oakland Airport, they uh, had their pipeline dug up one day. Backhoe, accidentally? Unexpected? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And basically impacted, yeah, all traffic. Wow. Everything. How long was that? Days. Wow, okay. Yeah. It took them a long time to fix it. Yeah, more than a week. Yeah. More than a week. So, so that's, uh, that's kind of a high level. And then if we want to take a look underneath the surface and, and start to see like the, the internet of invisible things, um, these are just uh, some high level overview of, of kinds of dependencies you look at. Um, I'll talk about more in depth later, but we're trying to build a tool that sits atop a simulation engine. And so here's an example interface for the tool. And you see the blue are, are physical kinds of um, lo important locations. And the pink are um, basically interconnections with your, your uh, communications or computer networks. And so you can imagine an interface where as the circles grow bigger, you have more of an issue in your, the scenario that you choose to run. So like I said, ships come in in the petroleum pier. And you need to be able to communicate, right? Uh, actually, by law, with the Coast Guard safety regulations, you need to have radio uh, in order for the person pumping the, the flammable stuff out of the, out of the ship uh, can communicate with the person on the pier. The person on the pier has to be able to set the valves so that the p product will flow to the right position in the tank yard. Now that, you could think you could automate that. They don't, no, they're, they're, they don't want to automate So it's a human, that. it's a fail-safe system by design yep. and probably legacy th uh, through there, but there is a dependency there. And the thing is, it's a shared manifold. So they're not separate, it's a shared co you know, community manifold that jet fuel and gasoline will all go through. But these pumps don't, you know, they sit maybe yay high off the ground. So then you think about things like storm surge, right? And same with things like generators and, um, you know, maybe junction boxes for your networks. Where are they relative to the threat of storm surge? Right? These are the kinds of things we want to think about. But anyway, radios we definitely need. The tank yard, you need to be able to monitor tank gauges and detect leaks. That's important from an environmental perspective as well as from a business perspective. Um, and you can't, you know, be monitoring all those tanks manually all day. You need to have some kind of system. And so there's remote terminal units that allow you to do that. Um, programmable logical, logic controllers, you can monitor the truck weight, you make sure your blend's correct because it's proprietary for petroleum. The additives are what, what give the thing, it's kind of a special sauce for these different, um, you know, petroleum companies basically. So like a Chevron may have something different than, I don't know, a shell. Sico, a Shell, right? Now that's that's programmable logic controllers, so it'd be really specialized. You know, the uh, you know people who do this aren't really concerned about. They didn't seem because it was like so specific. You need to become for that to become a real issue, but it's still something to to think about because uh, that is what interfaces directly with the trucks, and the trucks are what distribute the stuff to to all of us. Access gate, you know, PLCs again give us access through those gates uh, for the trucks. So you can imagine a disruption. You know that could due to the the situation with the roads as well. You could have buildup of traffic on the roads from that. Um, all kinds of issues could result depending on the duration of that outage. And the pipeline again, PLCs control the meters and the pumps and there's SCADA systems. And and actually talking with the pipeline people is pretty tough. So a lot of this you have to rely on, you know, what's out on the internet. But you can We're imagine sure anyway. So you know this is all field work, right? And then you go back into the back to the university and you're like, okay, well, we need to try to capture this somehow. So Coast Guard says, if you know a port, you know a port, one port. And so science is like, well, to what extent can you generalize this knowledge? And you have these arbitrary kinds of connections. So one good candidate for that is, is using graphs, right? Like graph theory gives you that. Um, being very specific about a language to describe um, the kinds of interconnections you can have between different assets. Um, could be useful for being able to say to what extent is this specific port similar to our, our general model over here. And once you have that kind of graph-based model, you can bootstrap a simulation and conduct what-if scenarios. Um, so here's an example. You know, tankers come in from the ocean, they go to a pier, 
through the manifold, it can go to a jet fuel tank, a gasoline tank, or an ethanol tank. But ethanol also comes in via railroad. A truck will come in off the highway and get a blend of gasoline and ethanol and go out to South Florida. But then ethanol, I mean jet fuel, can also go to an airport nearby. So you get a feel for what are the different assets, what are the commodities. It doesn't give you a sense of timing, however, uh, which you can capture through simulation. But it gives you an idea of the topology, of the general workflow that you're looking at. Uh, automation technology can also give you things like service times, right? Differences in service times, which is the whole point, because you want to up your throughput. But so speaking of cyber, this could you know run manually potentially, but there's also these dependencies here on the left, right? So like radio, you know you need communications between the vessel and the pier, and so this is a notion of data dependency, right? So in general, right, you could think of this as uh, you know capturing those dependencies between two types of graphs, right? One is the types of vertices in its transportation network. One is the types of services running on, on some computer network that you have. So you could blow these out and maybe do some cool co-simulation where you're actually able to say, okay, I want to run you know, a simulation where I have an automatic identification system that's giving me navigation for the vessel. So the people who need to park the vessel, because pilots will come in and actually park the vessel for the port, um, know what the vessel is and what kind of product it has. Um, I need to run a simulation where you know something happens to all these PLCs, and so all of a sudden my pipeline experiences some some issues. Maybe there's an outage is the simplest one to think about, but there could be others. And now if I'm going to walk through, um, you know what's flowing through the system? I have gasoline or, or jet fuel, and depending on where it comes from, it has a different price. So if you think about impact, you don't. It's like the point of origin hacking point, right? You don't need to necessarily, you know implement that, that whole attack through all the way through. You can just look at, think about theoretical impact and then simulate that. And some people might say, oh, that's not rigorous enough. But it gives you the kind of a back of the envelope sketch of you know, what you prioritize in terms of your defenses and also good for exercise. And, and you were identifying different stakeholders. So the pilot versus the, the money person who's probably never stepped foot in a, in a port before. Uh, all of those, they have their own tools. They have their own perspective or blind spots. And each of these vertices where they come together is a pivot, pivot point. And that could either be a collection point or um, a control point. Yeah. Uh, but it's important to, to have a way to describe these. And right now, there, there is no easy way to do that. Right. So we really want a, a human readable machine actual language that you can then start to talk about you know, what are the kinds of interactions between these different systems so that you don't have that, that field of like, I, it's not my problem, I don't have to worry about it. No, it could be your problem because everything's connected and becoming increasingly so. And so in a karmic kind of sense even, you'd want to be able to communicate. And like with the boundary between the two, you could do a co-simulation. So we just covered petroleum. Now we're going to go to container operations here. And it's a very similar kind of spiel. You have a shared resource, which is this road. And all the, you have different container companies that run at different times. So some container companies like to take lunch. Some don't. And it just so happens that the ones that like to take lunch have truck drivers that are really eager to get their containers, even when they know that they're taking lunch, because they, you know, time is money for them. So they queue up, and it gets longer and longer. Unfortunately, it gets longer and longer until it blocks the terminal that doesn't take lunch. And they're upset about that, because then the truck drivers can't get into their situation. So there's an example of a kind of disruption that happens uh, due to you know, it's not a, a cyber. It's just in, in terms of how people just conduct business. Yeah. And uh, the thing to keep in mind is, at one point, these roads cross over train tracks. Um, so you can disrupt trains as well. But anyway, truck lanes, trucks come in. They go to a gate. The gate, make, you basically, as a driver, need to say who you are. Are you are who you say you are? What's your purpose? Where are you coming here to pick up? And so there's a gate operating system that makes sure that that all checks out. Once you are able to check in, they'll say you're sketchy, so we're going to funnel you off to the sketchy area, or you're, you're OK, and you need to go here to pick up your container. That's in the container yard. And there's lots of cargo. And it's hard to know what's actually in a container, which makes it an interesting thing. So you can do uh, different targeting systems for different types of, of cargo. But essentially, you have gantry cranes that then load and unload cargo from ships that are docked at the terminal. Um, I'll go more into the, the invisible aspect of this. But these ships are getting bigger and bigger. The cranes are getting lot taller and taller. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind, why, why automation is so important. And then they move in and out of the seaway to bring goods and out of the port. 
and that seaway often is a shared um, uh, asset also mm -hmm. that includes non-shipping entities like yachtsmen or boating yeah. fisher people recreational boat. boats will just be going in there and, and that's something that the coast guard thinks about and tragedy of the commons right so you know you know Automated identification system. You need to identify ships as they come into port because usually the people that are, are moving the ships through on the ocean aren't the people that actually dock the ship. They have people specific at that port who will, will dock the ship. Gantry cranes use OCR or RFID to identify the cargo. So if you have any kind of issue with your OCR, you may not be able to identify the cargo other than manual. If your terminal operating system, for example, is disrupted, the fallback currently is pencil and paper. Right. But so that's not, you want to. I know, I know. I'm just, I was thinking of that, um, yeah. <laughs> creative, creative hacking, and artistic hacking right. involving QR, evil yeah. QR codes on top of these gantry chains, Django. I don't know. I'm sorry. You're that, gonna, you're we'll get to that. Funding. Thanks. No, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so like, this, is, this, is, this is problematic um, because like, you're creating a world where humans can no longer keep track of everything on purpose for this, you know, and blah, 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 off my soapbox. But a gate operating system is a similar thing. You want proper access of trucks to the container yard. And these are all hidden, in a sense, I mean, as a human. And the one thing I, I think about, just to throw something out there, is digital signage or, or conventions. Like, if I'm ill from jet lag, you can tell by looking at me, right? Like, what's going on? You look sick. We don't have anything like that, I don't think, for, for computers. Maybe that could be a cool thing to, to think about. Um, here's another really simple toy example, but nonetheless, gets the point across that you have someone who wants to ship something, distributes it, comes in over the highway, they go to the gate. This could be automated with automatic guided vehicles that don't even have places where people can sit anymore. That's something being considered. The only thing with that is what if an outage happens? How do you recover from that? And where's your labor to be able to recover from that? Uh, you have the gantry crane, which then loads things into the vessel. And so there's all kind of dependencies over here. There's other kinds of dependencies besides just data dependencies, like geographic, you know, geographic co-location, like they're in the same geographic area, right? That's another kind of interdependency you could get. But if you're thinking about data and integrity of data, this is where we're trying to just enumerate these different things. And right now, the two domains that we're bringing together are the cyber and physical, but you could put socioeconomic. I mean, imagine any yep. of those over domains that, that, in theory, you could build on top of this. Yeah, right on. Like, so for those operators, those operators have companies, and there's commodities flowing through. We're part of the project is to understand what commodities are going through. And then another layer is who, who is involved in those companies. So it's hard to manually, you don't want to manually do all this. So maybe there's something interesting you can do, similar to like in, a, in natural language processing, they have n-grams. So like n is 2, like what's a common phrase for n equals 2? Like it's raining, not like, um, I don't know, run, sit. That's not common, but it's raining is a common thing. So you're looking for patterns, basically. So one pattern that I could get out of open source data from DHS is, you know, based upon different data sets for power generation, power transmission lines, compressor stations, and pipelines, maybe via geographic distance, I can start to identify places where there's this situation. So if two nodes in these different data sets are close, I can connect them with, a with an edge, and I can have rules to define the direction, and then I can look to actually see where does power generation feed in to a transmission line, where does that transmission line feed into a natural gas compressor, compressor station? Where do those natural gas pipelines to which these guys are connected feed into that power generation? And now I have a loop. And identifying single points of failures across multiple ecosystems becomes trivial, but that's not the most interesting thing. Yeah. So like, what I want to be able to do is basically create you know, catalog. They have this thing in network theory called you know, motifs which is, is out of DNA world. And if we can find these motifs, we can start to look for more. Like, so I have a natural gas pipeline that connects to a receipt delivery that connects into a railway. Well, that's interesting, too, because now I could compose like the natural gas system here with electric power with the natural gas that feeds into the transportation system. And now you're starting to get into things that are better than like just what people cook up. You can start to encode this domain knowledge, but put it into a graph database so people could search it and then say which states have these structures that are most common. 
So things like that, trying to actually catalog what's out there in the wild. Certainly from a business standpoint, this would help you focus on the things that matter most to spend limited resources on. Uh, again, depending on that stakeholder view, uh, you start to get a much richer uh, picture and, and options. And you can start to look at these theoretical um, threat catalog items that you would never have been able to do yep. before. So speaking of threat catalog. Yeah. Um, so disruptions. Um, we want to look at the cyber physical disruptions. We've got this uh, simple example of a, I think you just showed it. Um, I'll let you walk through this yeah, one. Yeah, sure, if you keep clicking through, sorry. So with the disruption that we talked about. So let's say you have a radio that goes out. Now this is something that they're not really worried about because the duration wouldn't be too long. You could recover from it easily. But if you have a radio that goes out, you're unloading petroleum, communications between the vessel and the pier are affected. So now there's an issue with the pier and you can't flow a commodity through anymore. So if you click one more, that may affect your delivery of jet fuel and depending upon you know, the price of which jet fuel is going through, it could have more or less of a of a um, impact, also depending on the time of year and how busy it is at the airport. So what if a human human mistake or some uh, defective device wasn't just accidental, yeah. but you're trying to manipulate some commodities, um, a la Tokyo Joe or something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's important to have this uh, uh, maritime uh, 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 transportation system threat catalog specific to the stakeholders. So while I'm, we're not advocating look at every possible threat, uh, you need to have a broader threat catalog and you need to have a threat catalog that you can articulate or view by stakeholder. And many times in organizations that I'm uh, familiar with, uh, they have fairly mature risk management practices except that they're different. You have operational threat management um, or risk management, which is all about, in the CIA model, mm -hmm. availability. Keep the systems up. Operations is king. You have the compliance folks that want 100% compliance, even though they have the ability to, um, to have waivers for those. Um, you'll never achieve that and be business reasonable. So people spend a lot of time uh, politicking to have those uh, regula regulations change. And then you have the real risk management, which is the business office, who are making risk decisions all the time. And they, none of those uh, org groups talk to each other. If they were to talk to each other, they have the same uh, challenge that the ITOT folks have. They don't speak the same language. Uh, so what we want to do is, is create a stakeholder relevant but complete and flexible threat catalog. And the ones that we have here, I won't go and read it to you, uh, but this is, uh, this is an actual threat catalog. Yep. Uh, and this is one that we've re researched a, a little bit and have some war stories that we'll share with you here in a minute. Um, but uh, we're you know, trying hey, to expand it too, right? So we're talking to various stakeholders and, and integrating their, their experiences as well. So, so if you yes. guys have some, holler. So the fault category is pretty interesting. Is it accidental or intended? So there's kind of two states there, right? Uh, that's that's kind of cool. I like binaries. Uh, the um, the location. So this has that physical piece that there is a actuator or a sensor that exists in a specific place. Uh, the duration. Um, this is interesting. Uh, if you can equate each one of these to a bucket of money. Yep. That's typically, I know in air, airlines, uh, they know exactly how much they're losing uh, by a system being down when they have to recalculate, um, uh, uh, you know, re send planes in a different area. There's a problem too, like if, if you go for more than weeks, I've heard weeks, for ports, if you have to reroute uh, whatever's on the vessels, which way they go, the ports may not see that business again. Um, so there, there's a problem. Yeah. And of course, if you have perishables, uh, yep. any of those. And then there's real world examples uh, in each of these and we'll, we can talk a little bit about three of them that if these are not in your threat catalog today and you are in a cyber physical system you can you should look to see that you have those and these are real world examples these aren't future things so uh, anybody hear about the MERSC line um, collateral damage in the NotPetya uh, so it was ransomware and uh, I, I've, I relate an incident called Mr. Pink Mr. Pink don't tip. So I get a call on a Friday night, um, get off the plane, hey, we've got a problem. What, what's the problem? Uh, Lizard Squad is threatening to take down our um, uh, website. Hmm. I go, which one? Well, they didn't say. So it's like, okay, so we see it, we look at it, so we're doing the threat assessment. Okay, um, first, where's your policy on extortion? 
oh, we don't have a policy on extortion. Okay, check. Um, they want bitcoins. So, well, what's a bitcoin? Ugh. Check. Uh, so, you know, the thing basically turns out it was a, a fake. It was not a, a real attack. Um, but we, we chose not to tip because Mr. Pink don't tip. There was no place to pay it. They hadn't identified a real target. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, we didn't do that. Now this one uh, is actually a little bit um, uh, more sinister in that at the end of the day, nobody knows if they were really being attacked or not. But what they were attacked with uh, that locked them out of their own systems did not have an unlock key. That um, the not Petya, so even if they had Bitcoins and they had a policy that they pay, they couldn't. And their operations were impacted for about two weeks. And the estimates are it cost them uh, about $200 million, which these guys, maybe that's, it's material because they talked about it. So they had to actually put that in the annual report, which is interesting. That's a threshold too, when some people might gerrymand, you know, adjust the numbers so they don't have to report. But this one was pretty obvious because, well, nothing was coming through and they had to revert to but manual processes, the way we used to do it for thousands of years, yeah. uh, but not at this. So that was an interesting, um, when is ransomware not ransomware, when you're collateral damage and there's no way to, to pay the ransom. Uh, this one, uh, this is the port of Antwerp. Uh, this was a, a terminal operating system hack. The reason this one's so cool, and I'm going to pimp out the white paper. Go, if you haven't heard about this, go read the white paper because it goes in details and gives you all the links. Um, essentially, there was a physical breach of the terminal operating system. So somebody went in and deployed these devices. They went in, wet work. They did their own wet work. They plugged this stuff in, and it allowed them uh, not only to track where their contraband was in the ecosystem, so drugs, guns, whatever it was that they, their contraband was, um, but it, uh, you know, uh, there's so many other things they could have done with this. But what they did is once they knew where they were, they would send in their agents in, driving the truck yeah. with the right we're papers right to pick here. up the, the uh, shipping container and drive it out. And this worked for two years they yeah. were in the system doing this stuff? Do you know the, sort of the complexity or the required knowledge? Is the barrier to entry to doing this high? Or? Phys I would say physical security because none of this. None of this was advanced. This is just this is the, this radios. is basically I'm backing door and having radios so they didn't have to be on the property and they could have their guy who by the way had a sniper rifle because the way they got caught was some guy came and got his truck early and they couldn't let that con they couldn't let their shipment go away so they ended up shooting the, the trucks up but really good story but um, no this was a layer one attack I don't think there was anything sophisticated. Uh, uh, going on here. I mean, it uh, doesn't look like somebody had mad soldering skills. <laughs> but they, had own, they ended up owning the system the old-fashioned way. They went in there and did it themselves. So they didn't drop a USB in the parking lot. There was no zero days. Uh, and then there's this one. Dudes, where my, where's my yacht? So um, th this was the, there's several stories of people talking about this. I think there was, there was a, a war game that was done by the Coast Guard a couple months ago. Okay. I couldn't go to that where they basically uh, allowed people to come in and look try to hack the systems. But the the one that the, this story references is the University of Northern Texas. Yeah. Student was, was invited on a super yacht to see if he could hijack it and essentially it was a GPS attack. Unauthenticated protocol. His radio was bigger than the satellite's radio mm -hmm. and you know, but you that's go. a real issue. They're concerned about that. And they should be. I mean, we're, we have built these dependencies on unauthenticated un 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 protocols that are, you know, in space or, you know, in the cube next to you. So the idea here would be to make sure your threat catalog's up to date, maybe have some imagination that point of origin when you think how could I think that an adversary is probably all that or simultaneously having those same th thoughts get that threat ca catalog item in there and then the simulation is for, for for validating those looking for single points of failure looking for dependencies but also visualization these tools could help in incident <coughs> responders today I don't know how many of you sat on an incident and just had the first uh, hour introducing people first hour saying IP address this IP where is it there's no visualization you know I'm a visual creature and I you know you, you start throwing those numbers around then the new people come in and they're asking the same question so we not only see these tools for being able to help with uh, simulation and modeling but also to actually help an analysts in real time uh, support their operations 
So Gabe was like, well, could we use Packet Wars, which is our uh, eSport gaming pack uh, platform, and who's, gonna, who's played Packet Wars before? Who's going to play this week? Okay. So I'll give you an advanced, uh, this year's scenario is Some Like It Hot, and it will be a cyber physical challenge. I'll say, that's all I'll say. Um, but basically you have reports of uh, your physical control systems going offline, and you get all these reports coming into your operations center that says we have some physical systems that are going offline, uh, and those uh, failures suggest that uh, somebody's targeting your physical access system, or it's just kind of some systematic failure. Uh, to your, your gate controls and, and the, uh, the identity, the, what's the uh, T, TWI? Oh, transportation and worker identification. So those RFID badges? I don't, I need to double, I don't think those yeah. are actually, because they're talking about doing RFID. Okay, but well. they, they basically are some, some authentication mechanism that's used. And, and, you know, speed hacking, in five minutes you have to make a decision because you have two playbooks, right? This is either a targeted attack or systematic failure. Which is it? So that could be a scenario that we would put together. Okay. So here's a scenario where you have goods going out to Miami, to the south, and you have goods going out to western Florida as well, and you have a schedule of ships that are coming in. That's available, so you actually have the ability to tune your simulation with actual data in terms of your arrivals of ships, and it tends to be pretty, pretty stable uh, per season. And you have a cyber gate disabled here. So what's neat is, you know, vessels will come in through and then they'll unload at here into the container yard, which I already, we already walked through that, right? But there's also this inspections path you can take where they do things like open up the container or say, we're not going to open up, we're going to x-ray it. Or, oh, you need another x-ray. <laughs> and you can, you can just pick it up here if we let you. And then it moves out along the road. There's a gate right here that's a shared resource among all these terminal operators. And you know, there's different behaviors that you want to be able to capture, right? So, like, what are the service times at each of the, the different points in this network? How does that uh, get affected by different outages? Let's say you lose power. What happens at your intersections, for example? Um, what's your accumulated cost over time? And then what's the, what's the path? So here, you know, before we start playing with the cyber domain, we want to understand the transportation domain. So here's a simulation from 1919. So clearly we need, to, um, <laughs> we need to validate the model, right? But this is just verifying that, yeah, the code we wrote, it, it moves it through the system. We have it, it geocoded, and goods are coming through. Here they're going through the container yard. Here they're going through inspections, going out through the gate, traffic intersection. And the important thing to remember is ports aren't just these local things. More and more, even the economics literature underscores you need to understand how it affects the region. And the interactions between multiple ports is important. And here's Miami getting their, their jet fuel. And maybe uh, I think that's Fort Myers getting their, their t-shirts. So different <laughs> commodities will go through. There's other dependencies you can get at through uh, this database called Peers, which has all the bills of lading. And then you can start to see you know, different regional dependencies as well and, and <laughs> dig down into the details there. So we got five minutes left. Okay. The open source aspect of this data is really important uh, because it's out there and if, if supply chain, you've heard uh, blockchain being used for smart contracts, in theory, that data would also be out there unless it's encrypted. And you might want that transparency to have confidence in a system. So a lot of people are trying, you know, you, you can track your pizza order, mm -hmm. at least in the States, from when it's, before it goes in the oven and out, your FedEx, people want that. And, and those same executives that want to be on, they want that too. So how would that be accomplished? Mm -hmm. I mean, possibly blockchain. So here you have an ex this example, you know, at a certain time, all the goods get to where they need to go, except in the disrupted case. And the difference between the orange and the blue is, is where you start to think about the cost per unit of commodity, and that's your economic impact, a sketch of it at least. And you can also use actual data. So here you look at cyber insurance claims. So how do you know which kinds of attacks are, are, ha are reported at least, right? right? And maybe you can use that to help guide you. So there's tons of data breaches, but the losses are low versus, you know, IT processing errors, the losses are quite high. And there's a project at university. That's and this is interesting there. math. When you're disclosing to the street, they're low. When you're trying to get budget, it, the sky's falling. So <laughs> reconcile that. That's why actuaries, as much as you m might like or dislike the cyber, you know, insurance industry, itself 
this is some a place to watch because that's breach data will have to start appearing there if it's going to insurance are going to be able to underwrite that stuff. Here's a mock up for the uh, simulation. So we're trying to develop this tool or having a nice uh, slick interface for people to interact with the underlying simulation. So here you have the security level that will affect how long it takes to get through gates and other things um, because it's certain security levels. This is, is there a hurricane nearby or not? Depending on how close there is a natural disaster, you're going to change how high you can stack containers and other things. Then how long do you want a disruption to occur? And then what ships are coming in? And maybe some camera feeds as well. You can do that because it's a wireframe, right? So you can really. But, but ba the basic functionality of MARSEC level condition of the port, you saw this already for petroleum as well. And then you run the, the simulation for that time, and you can see how much money you lost based on that. And we can, and we can, so what we can do is not just do the simulations to identify hidden dependencies uh, or other areas, we could develop um, playbooks and instance fronts. We could do that now on things that are very unlikely or unlikely in the next five to 10 years. Uh, but they, we still need to think about them now when we're building these uh, legacy systems of the future. Mm -hmm. So here's another scenario, power outage that's affected traffic signals in the port. Uh, they have battery backups, but somehow are still failing. And then what's the root cause of the outage? Again, let's uh, try to figure out so this is how we're going to respond. Which play playbook do we pull? This is a, just a toy power example, but you, you actually can hook it up to a power simulator, which is interesting. There's a line outage here that feeds into a traffic signal, which is where the road and the rail are connected. So that road's important, right? Or that rail's really important, too. So if your power goes out, you're doing co-simulation, and this is just horribly abstract pseudocode, but the service time is then doubled, let's say. And so you want to build up that catalog, right? Not just between transportation and comms, but between power and transportation. And you start to, to get more and more interesting effects you can start to simulate. And, and, and the UP, UPS, one thing that's important, so this is real world from manufacturing. 50% uh, of this one entity's unplanned outages in their plants were caused by UPS problems. So it they had a requirement that requires that you have UPSs. It did not go beyond that. What, what spec, how much load, mm -hmm. what vendor. Uh, they were only tested randomly as part of uh, DR exercises that weren't real DR. They were paper exercises, and they randomly got checked. So root cause analysis of some data failures, when you really looked at data, mm -hmm. there's your root cause. So um, just because you have a UPS doesn't mean it's going to work when you need it. And that should be part of your testing criteria. And you should have standards more than, yes, UPS check. That's a compliance check, right? That's not real business risk management. Right. So I think hopefully these tools can get people in these different areas to, to talk. The beauty about what this does, it allows us to start to automate. So while I'm excited about Packet Wars, we can take all these crazy scenarios that we could never, and we can build, you know, get games and challenges or cyber challenges or training and assessment models on the fly. Yep. So this is the, the conclusion. Yeah, so basically we believe it's important to be able to, to see the hidden dependencies. It's important to stakeholders to, under, to understand their dependencies and to take active um, uh, uh, steps to do that. Uh, these um, shipping ports, great place to look at it because it's probably one of the most complex ecosystems that impact all of us, whether we realize it or not. And we believe that gamification and simulation is a good way to train and assess not only cyber operations personnel, um, but um, uh, maybe management and other stakeholders, um, and it can scale. Yep. And so I'm, you know, do we have a call for action? We have a call for action. I don't know what's on the call to action. Let's see. So right here. There, so. Well, the call to action is if you're interested. <laughs> so help us fill this out. <laughs> yes, it is invisible. There you go. No, it's, 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 you know, to get with us, we can share some of the research. If you have data that you want to share or if you'd like to give us a wicked problem or a scenario or that we could can. model, whether you want to have that overt and we can play it at some next troopers or some other cool hacker conference. Yeah, if you want to, like, uh, you know, you have a particular pet infrastructure you want to look at and there's some data sets out there already, um, that could be interesting, just talking about interdependencies. Again, building that catalog of interdependencies. Yep. So. so do something. Be the imp. Be the end. Okay. So that's it. That's, that's it. All we and got. We so that's all I got. Yeah. <laughs>